Professor Pauline Mayer, what was the glorious revolution of 1688? Uh, it was the occasion when the British threw out James II and brought in William and Mary and reconstituted their government. <laughs> How did we get from the glorious revolution of 1688 to the American Revolution of 1776? You just lasted it out. <laughs> well, the, it, the ideas that informed the Glorious Revolution that were cited to, uh, to justify it uh, were basically those that continued and re were used by Americans to justify their revolution in 1776. So there was real continuity. The ideas uh, that were expressed by, well, to name a familiar person, John, John Locke, or Algernon Sidney, other writers of the 17th century and popularizers in the 18th century carried on and they became um, basic political truths for Americans of the 18th century. What were some of those ideas? Well, the government isn't, uh, isn't determined by God. The people come together, they associate with each other, they form compacts uh, to create society and governments and that they, they appoint officials to serve their ends. The ideas are, are, are summarized very neatly in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, that all men lived once in a world where they were equal, where there were no kings. Every man was his own king. Uh, and that the inconveniences of that world, or the desire to protect people's rights in a, in a more durable way, uh, brought people together to form governments, and governments are created to protect those rights, to serve the people's security and their interests, and if they, uh, governments fail to do that, it is the right of the people to reform them uh, or to replace them. Now, in your first book, From Resistance to Revolution, Colonial Radicals and the Development of American Opposition to Britain, you write that the colonists sought, rather, a British revolution, one that would reconstitute the British government with new rulers and a firmer establishment of basic of basic rights and thereby save not only America, but Britain too. Yes, yes. Well, their, their comprehension of the political situation for the greater part of the period, uh, the decade before independence, was that the problem was uh, not just theirs, that there was a problem in Britain, uh, that the ministry had corrupted the parliament and that they were moving toward absolute power and that it was not just the Americans' fate, but that of the people at home in the British Isles were also affected by this. Uh, so there was, what I traced in that book were the efforts, sort of the hand, hands across the sea efforts, uh, the uh, correspondence of American radicals with people in Britain, like the supporters of the Bill of Rights who uh, were formed to support uh, the radical John Wilkes. Uh, that, that, that correspondence existed was a great surprise to me. I think when I first discovered it, uh, was when I was, a, uh, I was a graduate student writing a seminar paper and basically the book followed, the dissertation in the book followed from that discovery of this very interesting cross-Atlantic correspondence. Who was John Wilkes and why do you call him a radical? Well, John Wilkes was an opponent of, uh, of the British government. Uh, uh, he argued for greater political rights. He was uh, worried about the corruption of Parliament. Uh, he actually criticized the king as well as the ministry and went into exile for a period of time over this. And what was uh, interesting was the extent to which developments in his struggle uh, paralleled events that were happening in America at the same time. He ran for Parliament, I think, four times, uh, was elected by the freeholders of Middlesex County, and uh, he was just thrown out nonetheless, and eventually they seated his opponent. Uh, well, he'd been roundly defeated at the polls. Now, if Americans were concerned about the fate of their assemblies, uh, they had reason to think the problem wasn't just theirs. Uh, at one point, he had a, uh, there were a group of his supporters at St. George's Field that the army fired on. Uh, it sounded like the Boston Massacre to Americans. So they sensed there was a, a symmetry of issues and that they could work together uh, to get rid of the ministry, to get a new parliament. Uh, they could get to the root of the tree. The problem was in Britain. One more quote from Resistance to Revolution. Only under free governments were the people nervous 
spirited, mm -hmm. ready, and able to react against unjust provocations. As such, popular insurrections could be interpreted as symptoms of a strong and healthy constitution, even while they indicated some lesser shortcomings in administration. It was a sign of health. We need to remember that sometimes, I think. I've heard people argue that our democracy was in problem, was in trouble, given the evidence of these you know, uprisings in Wisconsin. I think it's a sign of, of the good health of our democracy. Certainly this was an item of faith in the 18th century. That people should be, they use the word jealous. And it, it isn't our sense of, of jealous. Jealous is I envy something that you have. It was that they were sensitive, that they reacted, and that if somebody did them a wrong, they didn't just take it. They, they, they responded, they defended themselves, they spoke up. Pauline Mayer, could you give us a snapshot of the Ameri of America in 1775? A snapshot. It's a very different place in 1775, of course. It, it is a number of very different places. Uh, the section, we tend to think north-south. This is looking toward the past through the Civil War. Uh, it was a much more complex place than that. New England had a kind of a common... Uh, system. It had uh, town governments. It had a, a common religious tradition, although there's a lot of differences uh, within the New England states. Uh, if you go a little further south, you get what we call the middle colonies, uh, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, very diverse in terms of their population. Uh, again, farming, largely grains. A little further south, you get to the Chesapeake, Maryland and Virginia. Again, a very different place. Now you have plantations rather than the family farms further north, uh, producing tobacco. Uh, slaves, yes, a larger slave force, but slaves were not unique to the, quote, south. And the south wasn't one thing. You had the Chesapeake and a little further uh, to the south, you would have South Carolina and Georgia. I have left out North Carolina, which is sort of between the two. Uh, but uh, something like 40% of the population in Virginia was slave. It was a major had been a majority since 1708 in South Carolina. But uh, slavery was everywhere. Uh, it was sort of 3% in New England. Uh, it wasn't a remarkable part of it is that, that it wasn't much criticized, I think. The, the real opposition to slavery came, except for Quakers, who saw that it was wrong earlier, uh, largely with the revolution, because it violated the principles that were expressed, for example, in the Declaration of Independence. Now, I don't know if that's what you mean, but there's no one picture of the United States in 1775 because there's so many different United States, if you will. In fact, it isn't the United States yet. They're the, they're the colonies, and, and they have very distinct cultures, very distinct economies. Was there a similar political mood across all 13 colonies uh, yes. in 1775? Yes. Now, here we get to the issue, how could they ever act together? I think they could act together because they had the same political assumptions and same political values, and they had a common enemy. There's nothing like an enemy to, uh, to pull diverse elements together. And to the extent that Britain had begun to... Uh, uh, first of all, to try to tax the colonies, although they weren't represented in Parliament. And then when the colonies resisted, uh, followed with other measures, uh, yes, they pulled together. They understood that the interest of any one colony was the interest of others, that if they could, if Britain could get by with, for example, uh, destroying the Assembly of New York because it had resisted a, a, a uh, it re refused to supply British troops, as, as Britain had asked, that if they could do that in New York, they could do it in any other colony. So although the British assumed that the colonies were so diverse they'd never get together, in fact, Britain pulled them together by its, by its policies. In your 1997 book, American Scripture, Making the Declaration of Independence, you write, in the decade or so after 1815, I discovered the document, the Declaration of Independence, began to assume the quasi-religious attributes later institutionalized without a shadow of subtlety at the shrines in the Library of Congress and more recently the National Archives. I confess, you write, that I have long been and remain uncomfortable with the use of religious words and images for what are, after all, things of this world. 
That practice strikes me as idolatrous and also curiously at odds with the values of the revolution.